when the Hand, Rogar Baratheon, and the Queen Regent left Dragonstone after the confrontation at the castle gates, Jaehaerys and his young wife, his sister Alysanne, immediately closed the gates and returned to her chamber. The island would remain their refuge for the rest of the king's minority. During this time, it is said that Jaehaerys and Alysanne were seldom apart, sharing every meal and talking to each other each night of the challenges that lay ahead of them. They spent time fishing, hawking, and even mingling with the small folk in the dockside inns. Alysanne would read to the king from dusty old books from the castle library. They also spent much time on Dragonback, but only adventuring as far as Driftmark. It took a further year and a half before they would finally consummate the marriage. Whenever lords and council members travelled to Dragonstone to consult with the king, Jaehaerys received them in the chamber of the painted table, where his grandfather, Aegon the Conqueror, had once planned his conquest of Westeros, with Alysanne always by his side. He argued that Aegon held no secrets from Visenya and Rhaenys, that he would not have any from Alysanne. Though there may have been no secrets between Jaehaerys and Alysanne, the marriage itself remained one to most of Westeros. Upon returning to King's Landing, Lord Rogar instructed all who had accompanied them to Dragonstone to speak no word if they wished to keep their tongues. When Septon Matthias attempted to send word of the match to the High Septon in Old Town, Grand Maester Benefat burned his letters rather than dispatch the Raven on the orders of Rogar. The Lord of Storm's End wanted time. Angry at the disrespect he felt the king had shown him, Rogar Baratheon remained determined to find a way to part Jaehaerys down the sand. He believed as long as the marriage remained unconsummated, then it could also be undone, with the realm none the wiser. Queen Alyssa wanted time as well, though for different reasons. What is done is done, she had said at the gates of Dragonstone, but memories of the bloodshed, the marriage of her other son and daughter, still haunted her. The Queen Regent was desperate to find some way to be sure the history would not repeat. But as the year of the three brides drew to a close, making way for the fifth year since Aegon's conquest, the Queen Regent and her lord husband still had a realm to rule till Jaehaerys reached his 16th birthday. The horrors of King Maegor's rule were fading into the past. The Iron Throne and the Faith were reconciled, and the young King Jaehaerys was beloved by all the small folk and great lords alike. But storm clowns were gathering on the horizon. In 50 AC, Westeros found itself with one king, a hand, and three queens. Each of these queens a power in her own right. In the Red Keep sat the Queen Regent, Alyssa, widow of the late King Aenys, mother to Jaehaerys, and wife to the hand, Rogar Baratheon. Across Blackwater Bay on Dragonstone, a young queen had arisen when Alyssa's 13-year-old daughter, Alysanne, married her brother, King Jaehaerys, against the wishes of her mother and Rogar. And far to the west on Fair Isle was Alyssa's eldest daughter, the dragon rider Rhaena Targaryen, widow of Prince Aegon the Uncrowned. In the Westerlands, Riverlands and parts of the Reach, men were already calling her the Queen in the West. But the bonds between them that allowed Maegor's downfall had begun to fray with the king and his young queen staying on Dragonstone the rest of the regency, with the biggest issue being the king's marriage to his sister. Rainer's marriage to Andrew Farman cannot be understated as a factor. Lord Rogar had never asked Jaehaerys for his leave to wed his mother, an omission the boy king took as a sign of disrespect. The king did not approve of the match, as he valued Rogar as a counsellor and a friend. He did not need a second father. Jaehaerys also felt he should have been consulted about his sister Rainer's marriage, though he felt that slight much less. Queen Alyssa, for her part, was deeply hurt that she had neither been advised nor invited to the Rainer's wedding on Fair Isle. In the West, Raina Targaryen had her own grievances. She neither understood nor shared her mother's affection for Rogar Baratheon, though she honoured him begrudgingly for rising in the support of Jaehaerys against Maegor. But his inaction when her own husband, Prince Aegon, faced Maegor was something she could not forgive. Over time, she had also come to feel resent that her claim to the throne and that of her daughters was passed over for Jaehaerys. She was the firstborn and had been a dragon rider before any of her siblings. Looking at all this tension in hindsight, it's very easy to say that Jaehaerys and Alysanne had the right of it. But at the time, with all that had happened under Maegor and the power of the faith, it's fair to say the Queen Regent and the Hand's concerns were legitimate. Lord Rogar Baratheon's motives were less selfless. A proud man, he had been stunned and angered by the ingratitude of the boy king he had regarded as a son and humiliated when forced to back down at the gates of Dragonstone in front of half a hundred of his men. A warrior to the bone, Rogar had once dreamed of facing Maegor in single combat and could not stomach being shamed by a boy of 15. However, though Rogar would do some cruel, foolish and even evil things things during his last years as Hand. He was not a cruel or evil man at heart. He had been a hero one and should by all right be remembered that way. In the immediate aftermath of his first confrontation with Jaehaerys, his first impulse was to return to Dragonstone with more men, enough to overwhelm the castle garrison and resolve the situation by force. In the end, only Queen Alyssa could dissuade him from this. She pointed out her children rode dragons and he did not. The Queen Regent also wished to have the King's rash marriage undone. She convinced that it would once again set the faith against the crown. Had Jaehaerys and Alysanne 
Cameron returned to King's Landing in time to celebrate the New Year. As Queen Alyssa had hoped, she told the council that they would come to their senses and reconciliation might have been possible, but this did not happen. When the king did not reappear at court, Alyssa announced their intention to return to Dragonstone, this time alone, beg her children to come home. Rogar angrily forbade it. He told his wife if she went crawling back to him, the king would never listen to her again. He also pointed out that he had put his own desires above that of the realm and that could not be allowed or he'd end up like his father. Days turned into weeks and fortnights as all grew more resolute on both sides of Blackwater Bay. Jaehaerys and Alasan remained on Dragonstone awaiting the day when Jaehaerys would take the rule of the Seven Kingdoms in his own hands. Queen Alyssa and Rogar continued to hold the reins of power in King's Landing searching for a way to undo the king's marriage and avert the calamity they were certain was about to come. Once the marriage had been annulled, his lordship reasoned it would be as if it had never happened, so long as it remained a secret. Until the union was consummated, it could easily be set aside. It's not known why Jaehaerys kept silent about the marriage. Arguments have been made that maybe he was fearful of the faith, but knowing the kind of man Jaehaerys was, he was a king who never acted without thinking. Jaehaerys was not repenting his marriage, and had no intention of undoing it. He had chosen the queen he wanted and would make the realm aware of it at a time of his own choosing, in a manner best calculated to lead to acceptance. When he was a man grown, a king ruling in his own right, not a boy who had wedded in defiance of his mother. The king's absence from court did not go unnoticed. The bonfires lit in celebration of the new year had hardly gone out before the people at King's Landing began to ask questions. To stop rumours, Queen Alyssa put out word that his grace was resting and reflecting on Dragonstone. But as more time passed, lords and small folk began to wonder, was the king ill? Had he been made a prisoner? The king often mingled in the crowds of King's Landing, so his sudden disappearance was unlike him. Queen Alassane was in no haste to return to court, as she knew once they returned, their time together would be limited. For her, these days on Dragonstone were idyllic. Jaehaerys himself no doubt shared these sentiments, but the king had other reasons for remaining on Dragonstone. Unlike Magor, he was not prone to bursts of rage, but he was more than capable of anger, and he would never forget, nor forgive, his deliberate exclusion from the council meeting, where his marriage and that of his sister were being discussed. And while he would always remain grateful to Rhaegar Baratheon for helping him to take the Iron Throne, Jaehaerys did not intend to be ruled by him. The king recognised and accepted his role in Magor's fall, but had also become very aware of Rogar's flaws. Jaehaerys was aware of his own shortcomings too, shortcomings he intended to rectify before he sat the throne. His father, King Aelit, had been slighted as weak, in part because he was, because he was not the warrior that his brother Magor was. Jaehaerys was determined that no man would ever question his own courage or skill at arms. On Dragonstone, he had Samaril Bullock, commander of the castle's garrison, and his own king's guard, the finest fighters in the realm. Every morning, Jaehaerys trained with them in the castle yard, shouting at them to come at him harder, to press him, harry him, and attack him in every way they knew. From sunrise to noon, he worked with them, honing his skills with sword and spear, mace and axe, while his adoring new queen looked on. Jaehaerys was often bruised and bloody, by evening, much to Alassane's distress, but his prowess improved so remarkably that near the end of his time on Dragonstone, Ilyas himself told the king, although he will never be a king's guard, but if by some sorcery Magor were to rise from the grave, the king could give him a good fight. One evening, after a day in which Jaehaerys had been severely tested and battered, Maester Caliper asked him why he punished himself so harshly, as the realm was at peace. It is said the king only smiled and replied that the realm was at peace when his grandfather, Aegon the Conqueror, died, that his father, King Aenys, had hardly climbed the throne before his foes rose on all sides, that they were testing him to see if he was strong or weak, that these same people would test him again, that he wanted to be ready. Jaehaerys was not wrong, but his first trial, when it did come, would be a very different nature, one that no amount of training in the yards of Dragonstone could possibly have prepared him for, for it was his worth as a man and his love for his queen that was about to be put to the test.